Thanks, uh, thanks, Jim, uh, for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks to the Exchequer Club uh, for hosting this event. Uh, and I'm looking forward to future events taking us back uh, to the lunch and discussions at the Mayflower Hotel, uh, which has been the club's tradition now for over half a century. Um, uh, this afternoon, uh, as Jim said, I'll uh, consider the challenges that the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus uh, and especially the containment measures taken by many governments in response, which uh, together I'll call the COVID event, uh, pose for the financial system uh, and for international cooperation on financial stability. And I'll do that in the context of a report that the Financial Stability Board published last week, evaluating the progress we've made in addressing the too big to fail problem for banks. Uh, the evaluation has relevant and timely things to say about the resilience of banks, and the financial system more generally during this time. So let me start with the challenges posed by the COVID event for financial stability. The containment measures of the COVID event represent the biggest test that the financial system has faced since the global financial crisis of 2007 and 8. After years of reforms, we now face a real life stress test, even more severe uh, than those previously experienced or hypothesized. Uh, but unlike the global financial crisis, this shock originated from outside the financial system. The first phase of the impact of the COVID event on the financial system was the market turmoil we experienced in March. This was the result of severe uncertainty, triggering major repricing and volatility in global financial markets, disrupting the flow of credit to the economy. We saw many examples of a dash for cash with firms drawing down their lines of credit with banks, and the indiscriminate sale of assets by investors in order to obtain liquidity. The policy response by central banks and governments to this liquidity shock was rapid and decisive. The authorities worked together to address the problem through a combination of monetary, fiscal, and regulatory measures, and those interventions led to rapid improvements in financial markets. Credit spreads have narrowed for both investment grade and high yield bonds. Markets are functioning in an orderly manner and credit provision to the economy is held up. But the COVID event is not behind us yet. Many households and businesses remain under pressure. According to the latest IMF forecast, the global economy is projected to contract sharply by 4.9% in 2020, a much worse outcome than during the 2000-2008 financial crisis. And while some indicators suggest a rebound in activity, the path of recovery remains highly uncertain. Banks entered the current crisis in a much stronger position than they did in the global financial crisis. They're much better capitalized and more liquid than back in 2008. And that's a direct outcome of the G20 regulatory reforms adopted in the aftermath of that crisis and measures taken by the banking industry, which have improved the resilience of the core of the financial system. This has allowed the banking system to absorb rather than amplify the current macroeconomic shock. It's also enabled banks to play a central role in measures to support the flow of credit to the economy. A number of stress tests carried out recently in a variety of FSB jurisdictions have confirmed that banks are able to continue lending even in the face of this extreme shock. Less than two weeks ago, we at the Federal Reserve concluded that our banks would generally remain well capitalized under a range of extremely harsh hypothetical downside scenarios stemming from the COVID event. Even with that demonstrated strength, however, given the high levels of uncertainty, we took a number of prudent steps to help conserve the capital in the banking system. We know that the financial system will face more challenges. The corporate sector entered the crisis with high levels of debt and has necessarily borrowed more during the event. And many households are facing bleak employment prospects. The next phase will inevitably involve an increase in non-performing loans and provisions as demand falls and some borrowers fail. The official sector is providing a rapid and coordinated response to support the real economy, maintain financial stability and minimize the risk of market fragmentation. And the FSB is overseeing international cooperation and coordination of the responses of financial authorities to the COVID event. This brings us to the FSB's evaluation of too big to fail reforms. I should note at the outset that the analysis was conducted before the onset of the COVID event. Nonetheless, 
a number of the conclusions are relevant to policymakers and market participants in the current situation. We should first cast our minds back to the global financial crisis. While the issue of too big to fail had occupied regulators and finance professionals for decades, it was in the 2008 crisis that the contours of the too big to fail problem in a globalized world became clear. In 2010, Mervyn King, the then governor of the Bank of England, noted that most large complex financial institutions are global, at least in life, if not in death. In this pithy sentence, he summed up the challenge policymakers faced. Decades of bank expansion and cross-border integration had provided many economic and social benefits, such as the ability to finance global supply chains. But the web of relationships and exposures had become complex and opaque. When big banks ran into trouble during the financial crisis, regulators faced a stark choice, disorderly failure or taxpayer-funded bailouts. At the heart of the problems faced by authorities at the time were two issues. The problem before, the market had assumed that banks would not be allowed to fail. Banks and their creditors didn't bear all the downside risk, and so they took on too much risk. This tendency, moral hazard, caused substantial economic distortions. And the problem after, authorities didn't have the capacity to resolve a failing large international bank and were compelled to rescue banks at a significant cost to the taxpayer. Drawing on the lessons from the crisis, the G20 leaders endorsed a package of reforms to tackle these two problems for systemically important banks. The package comprised, one, standards for additional loss absorbency through capital surcharges and total loss absorbing capacity requirements. Two, recommendations for improved supervision. And three, policies uh, to put in place effective resolution regimes and resolution planning. I mentioned earlier that banks have entered the crisis in a position of strength. Bank capital has increased significantly. For global systemically important banks, GSIBs, tier one capital ratios have doubled since 2011 to 14%. This is a combined result both of the Basel III reforms agreed in 2010 and of independently improved decision-making at our large banks. But the too big to fail evaluation also finds that the capital surcharges for systemically important banks have contributed to enhanced resilience. Moreover, banks in advanced economies have built up significant loss absorbing and recapitalization capacity by issuing instruments that can bear losses in the event of resolution. Supervisors and firms are better equipped to deal with problems that occur. Supervisory oversight of systemically important banks has learned the lessons of the crisis and has added a macroprudential perspective. The Basel III framework introduced additional capital and liquidity buffers, which are intended to be usable in a downturn to help maintain the flow of credit to the real economy. Before the global financial crisis, the resolution of failing banks was a niche subject. In hindsight, most authorities around the world had given it far too little attention. This was the main reason why authorities had so few options for our global systemic banks in the middle of the crisis. Things have changed in that regard and for the better. Resolution authorities have sprung up or have been strengthened around the world and resolution frameworks provide these authorities with the powers to resolve a systemically important bank in a manner that maintains financial stability and reduces taxpayer expense. The FSB's evaluation shows that investors increasingly expect failing banks to be resolved rather than bailed out. The funding cost advantages enjoyed by systemically important banks has fallen. Market prices suggest that investors are now pricing the risk of having losses imposed upon them in the event of a bank failure. For most jurisdictions that are home to GSIBs, credit rating agencies no longer assume governments will bail them out. Recovery and resolution planning have improved banks' capabilities to produce timely, accurate, and granular information. Timely information in a crisis is key to assessing the scale of a problem and to deciding what to do about it. This additional information has already proved helpful to both banks and authorities during the pandemic. Taken together, these resilience and resolution reforms 
lower the probability of banks failing, reduce the consequences and costs of a bank failure, and provide additional options for dealing with failing banks that simply didn't exist before the global financial crisis. We have to ask ourselves, however, whether we have addressed the problems set out by Mervyn King in the wake of the global financial crisis, can authorities now resolve complex international banks without recourse to public funds while maintaining financial stability? And does the coordinated international approach we've now adopted provide for effective resolution of banks by ensuring that while they are global in life, we also have a global solution in depth? The FSB evaluation provides evidence that the reforms are indeed achieving their objectives. We're moving to a world in which global systemically important banks can be global in life and orderly in death. We think we're getting closer to a solution to the problem framed by Mervyn King. We have an internationally coordinated response grounded in national law by pre-positioning loss absorbing resources in life and planning for an orderly resolution in the event of failure. We can provide the policymakers who come after us with more options than they had in the great financial crisis if they're faced with future systemic financial stress. Now, of course, there's more to do. The benefits of reforms can't be realized unless they're operationalized. All FSB jurisdictions need to implement resolution reforms and to improve their resolution capabilities so they're fully prepared to respond to a bank failure or a crisis. The FSB's evaluation shows that systematically, uh, systemically important banks remain very complex, highlighting the importance of resolution planning. The evaluation also highlights gaps in the information available to the public authorities and to the FSB and to standard setters, which reduces our ability to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of, of, of resolution regimes. The FSB continues its work to ensure that banks and other financial institutions and market infrastructures can be effectively and safely resolved. Those are issues on which we'll need to reflect and work further. The financial landscape is also changing and the FSB needs to be responsive. The FSB's monitoring shows that the share of bank assets as a percentage of total financial assets has dropped from 46% in 2008 to 39% in 2018. As non-bank financial institutions increase their market share risks have moved outside the banking system. The market turmoil in March underlines the need to better understand the risks in non-bank financial intermediation and reap the benefits of this dynamic part of the financial system without undermining financial stability. There may be lessons for us to learn about the framework that we need to apply to this sector, which is different from, and less developed than, the one used for banks. At the FSB, we established earlier this year a balanced working group of bank and non-bank authorities to look closely and concretely at these issues. And the COVID event has given focus and vitality to this effort. Separately, we've already announced that our next evaluation will examine the post-crisis reforms to money market funds, which were once again front and center in the COVID event. Finally, we want to hear from you. Our consultation closes on 30th of September uh, with regard to this FSB report. We're keen to receive responses from a wide range of stakeholders. I'd highlight the need for responses to be grounded in evidence. The FSB will take account of feedback to the consultation and publish a final report in early 2021. And that will also provide us with additional evidence on how banks have responded to the COVID event and any lessons learned for our evaluation. Thank you again, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much. Um, as you note in your remarks, the uh, FSP's report indicates that the reforms put in place contributed to the resilience of the banking system and its ability to absorb rather than amplify shock. You spoke to uh, some of the uh, issues that remain open and require additional review. Is there more that needs to be done to address too big to fail this? Uh, well, uh, it's a very large issue. Uh, and, you know, I think the report, the, the, the uh, uh, draft report that's been circulated, uh, does, a, uh, does a good job of addressing a wide range of the issues, but uh, I wouldn't say that it's comprehensive. Uh, I certainly wouldn't say uh, that our work is done. I, uh, 
you know, with respect to the too big to fail question, uh, oftentimes, particularly in congressional hearings, I'll get asked, so have we solved too big to fail? Uh, give me a yes or no. I, I, think, I think the right answer to that question is uh, the too big to fail problem, as I talked about in my remarks, was principally one of policymakers not feeling that they had and indeed not having uh, enough options uh, to address troubled institutions uh, in a time of stress. Uh, and I think what the FSB report shows is that we have given policymakers more options. Uh, can we increase the range of those options? Can we increase the usability of those options? I think there will always be more that we can do uh, to, refine, uh, to refine that. I think that, again, our understanding of that will benefit from the input that we're seeking with respect to this draft report. Um, uh, which is why I'd encourage you all uh, to, to look at it and, and send in uh, considered thoughts. Um, so, uh, so I do think that we have created more options, uh, but it would certainly be premature to say uh, that there's nothing more to be done with respect to the issue. Okay, thank you. So let me ask about one issue that did not appear to be addressed in the report, and that's the impact of the liquidity rules that were put in place after the crisis and how they affect large banks and financial markets. Is FSB going to take a closer look at, at those requirements and impacts? Uh, so we have, uh, you know, we, we are planning to do a series of evaluations of post-crisis reforms. Uh, and uh, that, would, that will be a uh, uh, sensible review uh, to include uh, at, at the proper moment. It's not uh, sort of on the uh, agenda currently, uh, but this will be a, an ongoing process of taking issues uh, and looking at them closely in the way that we have now done for Too Big to Fail, that we've done before for infrastructure financing and small business financing and the effect of the post-crisis reforms on those areas of, of uh, uh, financial activity. Uh, so in, in the future, uh, I think that that's something that the FSB should look at. Okay, thanks. Another issue that is highlighted in the report are the interconnections between large banks and central counterparties. Uh, you know, clearly the establishment of central counterparties is kind of uh, positive in many respects, but also is it a source of concern to the FSB? Um, I don't know that I would say, you know, concern is probably, uh, it, 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 you know, may not be the right uh, word. Uh, it's an issue that I think that we need to monitor uh, and continue to uh, look at. Um, uh, we, we do regularly uh, have uh, discussions about this and there are work streams uh, related to uh, central clearing uh, at, at the FSB currently. Um, uh, again, the, you know, the uh, elements of the recent COVID event have not uh, given us reason to have, I, I think, heightened uh, concern, but it is an issue that we uh, continue to study and monitor. Okay. Well, one more question on the report, then I want to shift to other topics. But my last question is, is there anything in the report that surprised you? Um, uh, so uh, I, I guess I would say up to now, um, uh, not really. I wouldn't say that I was necessarily surprised, but I wouldn't have been surprised had the had you know some of the answers come out uh, other than they did. Uh, I think it, it has been very uh, carefully done. Uh, the working group that we put together to do it, uh, you know, un under the leadership of a uh, uh, deputy governor of the Bundesbank, uh, Claudia Buch, uh, has has really done uh, I think a careful and thorough job. Uh, of what is a very big question, and so they wouldn't claim, again, to have uh, uh, comprehensively addressed all issues related to it. Um, uh, but uh, I would say, uh, with respect to was there anything that surprised me, that's why you play football games. I'm not necessarily surprised at the outcome of any particular football game, but you don't know what the outcome is going to be until you've actually done the work. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if, again, input uh, from the public on the, uh, on the report uh, were to uh, you know, result in important additions that currently aren't there. Uh, 
Um, uh, again, this is a, uh, this is work that's been pretty thoroughly done, uh, but the report won't be complete until we've had this uh, uh, public input. Uh, and again, I won't be surprised if that uh, results in, in some useful additions to it. Okay, well, thank you. And thank you for reviewing and summarizing the report. I'd like to, to shift and uh, focus on some other aspects of the Fed role. Uh, the Fed has played a very significant role in stabilizing financial markets through its use of uh, credit facilities since the pandemic. Um, at this point, is the board considering the creation or receive the need for the creation of any additional credit facilities or modifications in the ones that are outstanding? Well, I, I, I'm sure most people uh, on the wire here will know, uh, I mean, we uh, have, have just uh, recently uh, proposed expanding the Main Street facility to include nonprofits, uh, you know, and a, a framework for doing that. Um, and as we have done with a number of the facilities, and as that's an example of, you know, we are constantly uh, learning from the evolution of the environment. Uh, and again, from uh, input of those who are using or contemplating using the facilities, uh, you know, how they can be improved and refined. Uh, you know, at the moment, there's uh, nothing in the oven baking, uh, but we're, uh, you know, but we're, uh, never announcing that, okay, well, this is it, and, and now we're done. Well, let's stay with the Main Street one just for a second. There was a press story last week in the journal that indicated that both the banking industry and business community was reacting rather lukewarm to the design of that facility. Can you speak with any specifics as to how the board may respond to the use of that facility? Well, so I'd say I'd say a few things. I mean, it it, it just became operational uh, 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 maybe yesterday, so it's a little premature, uh, uh, I think, to make judgments as to uh, uh, yeah, as to uh, what demand is going to be over the life of the facility uh, or what the utility is going to be. Uh, we have had uh, in the run-up. Uh, to making it operational. I mean, there are hundreds of banks and firms that have, uh, uh, you know, that have uh, engaged and expressed interest uh, in using the facility. Um, uh, it's also the case that all of the uh, Fed's facilities uh, exist. I, I'd go back to some of my remarks, which is that the COVID event isn't over. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty as to how it can evolve. Uh, it's a positive, it would be a positive thing in my view, uh, if, uh, you know, the private economy were, uh, able to handle, uh, you know, the, the great bulk of the credit needs of the economy currently. Uh, but we can't count on that, uh, being the case throughout the further evolution of this event. It may turn out to be if things evolve very positively, it may not. Uh, and the, uh, initial take up on the uh, on the Main Street facility is certainly not indicative of what that take up might be uh, given some very uh, possible uh, evolutions of the future that uh, that we might see. Okay, thank you. One last question on the facilities. Uh, some of the facilities are tied to ratings by uh, only the three largest nationally recognized statistical rating organizations. Uh, is the board giving consideration to including uh, all SEC recognized and our SROs in these facilities? Uh, so we have uh, looked at uh, sort of the broad range of uh, uh, NRSROs uh, uh, that provide uh, ratings uh, to firms. And we have a uh, a framework, uh, if you will, for looking at any particular uh, rating agency and determine, determining whether for a particular product or in a particular market, uh, you know, it shows the necessary experience uh, and, um, uh, uh, you know, range uh, in order for that to be a, uh, a useful and appropriate supplement given uh, the, the, really statutory and policy requirement that we have uh, to uh, uh, 
uh, to be quite um, uh, solid in how we assess uh, credit that, that uh, we're extending. So uh, the result of that uh, review uh, so far has been the addition uh, in a number of circumstances of, uh, uh, of a broader range of NRSROs. Uh, and again, like everything, uh, we continue to uh, uh, we continue to look at how the economy is evolving. Uh, so, so that 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 has expanded uh, to include more than uh, just the uh, the standard in NRSROs. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned stress tests in your opening remarks, and I've got a series of questions that uh, on that that topic. Um, so, if we could dive in, into those, and first, will the resubmission of capital plans be based on a sensitivity analysis or a full round of stress? Uh, well, I wasn't expecting you to ask about stress testing at all. Uh. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, so I would say we're, um, we're delving into that now. We haven't decided whether, um, the resubmitted capital plans, uh, will be subject to a full-blown stress test, uh, whether it would be more along the lines of the sensitivity analysis, uh, that we did in connection with, uh, the last stress test, uh, that will depend on uh, sort of the, the range and reliability of the data that we uh, think that we have um, as we continue uh, to monitor this uh, in the, uh, the, the work that we think that we, that we can do, how quickly is the environment evolving, which obviously makes it harder to conclude that, uh, you know, that a, a full-blown stress test uh, is useful because that's a lot of work that you have to cut you have to have a cutoff on at a certain point, and, uh, and if the situation is evolving quickly, uh, you might be limited to a sensitivity analysis uh, with respect to the current situation, as we were uh, with respect to the last stress test. Which is, you know, even if that's the limitation that we would ultimately face, that's still a very useful thing to do. Those were very, again, uh, carefully done sensitivity analyses. Um, so, um, uh, so I would say. We're still working that through. We plan to issue, uh, you know, a set of FAQs uh, uh, shortly, um, uh, probably probably a couple of weeks, um, uh, that will address uh, a number of some of these technical and logistical issues uh, surrounding the surrounding the stress test. Uh, but even then, some of them uh, we may continue to be working through even after the issuance of those FAQs. Okay, thank you. Well, regardless of how it's structured. Uh, would uh, the test be used to recalibrate and update the stress capital buffers for each firm? Uh, so that, I mean, it, it's a good point that gets to, with, res get, with respect to the first question a bit, right? So whether we call this, uh, you know, the, the next uh, uh, steps, uh, a sensitivity analysis or a stress test, or whether we call it a purple panda, uh, you know, the question is what, what use will be made of the results of the analysis? Um, the the um, you know a principle that we have followed that we followed uh, with respect to the recently concluded exercise and that has always been part of the uh, post crisis capital framework uh, has been that you should ensure that you have uh, robust levels of capital. Uh, going into a crisis, that you maintain robust levels of capital uh, uh, during peacetime, so that as you enter stress, you aren't in a position of needing to raise capital, which would uh, require banks, in inevitably would create strong incentives for banks to rein in the extension of credit uh, during the stress event itself. So uh, that principle would continue to guide us, uh, will continue to guide us as the COVID event continues to evolve. Um, uh, uh, now, if the future analysis, whether it's a sensitivity analysis or, or a stress test, whatever we call it, uh, were to show, uh, given how the world evolves between now and then, dramatic, um, you know, a, a dramatic increase in the need for capital, 
uh, which the most recent sensitivity analysis did not show. Uh, it showed that the banks really were, in the face of everything that we could throw at them, uh, still quite robustly capitalized. Um, uh, but if the world were to evolve in a way that uh, it showed something different, uh, then uh, that might require an adjustment to the SCBs. Um, uh, but again, we would, uh, it's a pretty strong principle that during the stress event itself, you don't want to be causing the financial system to rein itself in uh, if you don't have to uh, because of the consequences for the real economy. Thank you. Well, let me ask about uh, the restrictions that were put in place and what it might take for an institution to uh, to access some of those restrictions. If the stress capital buffer is not recalculated, uh, would a bank holding company have to complete some other form of quarterly stress test until it uh, decide the board decides the uh, return for the stress capital buffer is uh, is warranted or not? Um. Well, so, I, so I'd say a few things about that. Our, uh, our current framework, uh, which is really not a, a departure, uh, the current capital conservation measures that we have in place isn't really a departure from our, uh, from our previously articulated framework, from, this, uh, uh, from the way the world is supposed to work in a very unusual event like this. Um, uh, and the capital conservation measures that we uh, have imposed uh, really seek to uh, emulate during this transition period to the implementation of the stress capital buffer, uh, which you know the, the COVID event happened at exactly this transition moment. So we wouldn't have had a stress capital buffer until October of this year, uh, even once the stress test was run. I mean that that was the framework, and in the existing capital framework, when a stress test is run. It's then up to the board to decide what measures to take. Uh, and in this instance, because uh, until we move into the stress capital buffer world uh, in October, where that would be more automatic, where the capital restriction measures would be more automatic given the, the, where one was in the stress capital buffer. Uh, but we weren't there yet. So we had to do something and that was just the existing framework. Uh, and the something we did, we tried to clone as much as possible uh, to what would happen if we were in the stress capital buffer world and uh, in the events that the sensitivity analysis showed were uh, possible, uh, uh, possible outcomes uh, were happening. So, uh, so I do think that we have, we, we haven't really departed from the framework as much as we uh, have uh, sought to act within the framework during this time of transition. So then, um, I think it's also important to note with response to your question that the measure, the capital conservation, the capital, capital conservation measures that we have taken uh, are quarter to quarter. We made a decision for a quarter. Uh, the default would be depending on, you know, if, if we do nothing, uh, then we move into the stress capital buffer world uh, in the next quarter. Um, if our continued monitoring of uh, both banks and the uh, macroeconomic environment uh, would show uh, between now and the fourth quarter uh, that an extension of some or all of those uh, capital conservation, conservation measures is prudent, uh, then we would act again uh, for another quarter uh, to do that. Uh, our, our system where dividends are paid out quarterly uh, it, it is, you know, lends itself uh, to that sort of a, uh, an evolving judgment. It'll, it gives us the advantage of being able to uh, see in real time how the world is evolving. Uh, and we have structured uh, the framework that, uh, of measures that we took after the last stress test uh, in order to give us that opportunity. Okay, well, one last question on, on stress testing. Um, and that's, will the board to disclose uh, firm specific results or expect firms to disclose results of the new stress test? Um, uh, so that's a good question. I think, again, it will depend on the, uh, on the confidence that we have in both the comprehensiveness, quality, 
uh, and uh, uh, depth of the data that we feel we have and the analysis that we're able to do uh, between now uh, and the end of the year when we've looked at the resubmitted capital plans and, uh, and run this next analysis on them. And again, whatever we call it, uh, uh, if, it is, if it's granular enough and, and deep enough, uh, and we feel that the uncertainty around the evolution of the environment has settled down enough that we can uh, uh, that we can make some statements with confidence about individual firms. That would be an appropriate thing uh, to uh, uh, to disclose. Uh, if, as in the case with the sensitivity analyses we just ran, we are uh, we are very confident that it gives us insight into the performance of the system, uh, but not uh, enough uh, that we can attach labels to particular institutions, uh, you know, then, then we would uh, make that judgment accordingly. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll look forward to the FAQ. Uh, another regulatory policy, it's more of an accounting policy, I guess, that's been impacted by the pandemic is the uh, implementation of the CECL accounting standard. Uh, under the interim final rule that was published this past March, uh, firms that are required to adopt CECL during this year have an option of delaying for two years the estimated impact, followed by a three-year transition period. Is the board considering making the capital offset permanent or making other refinements to the regulatory capital framework to adjust for the impact of CECL? And more generally, are there any broader discussions with FS? FASD about rethinking the standard due to potential conflicts between CECL and the board's efforts to ensure appropriate levels of capital during times of economic stress. So, um, uh, you know, so I think our extension of the uh, transition period uh, for banks subject to CECL, where essentially, uh, you know, for two years, we'll hold banks harmless and then phase in the, the CECL effect over the following three years. Uh, gives us in the, uh, uh, you know, in the bank regulatory arena, the ability uh, to see how it is that CECL is operating. This is something that uh, I've said throughout the debate uh, on CECL, uh, which is we've received uh, a wide range of uh, you know, really quite uh, uh, thorough and quantitative analyses of how CISO would operate in times of stress. Uh, we're having the opportunity now uh, to get some real world experience uh, for how it would operate. Uh, the hypothetical analyses pointed in several different directions, uh, all of them uh, quite precisely from very persuasive from very credible people. Uh, so, uh, so what we should be doing now is looking at, uh, at how CISO operates uh, and then deciding whether there are adjustments to our bank regulatory framework that we can make uh, in light of how CECL uh, will operate uh, in order to achieve uh, our objectives as bank regulators and bank supervisors. I think we have the tools and the ability to do that. We have the time to do that during this now extended transition period. We have the data to do that uh, from the fact that we've gone through, uh, you know, the worst stress uh, uh, almost the worst stress conceivable. I guess the earth could get hit by an asteroid. Um, and, uh, and all of that will allow us to come to judgments. Um, I, you know, the, the FASB is an independent agency. It makes its accounting uh, rules. Uh, I think that there is uh, merit uh, in that system. Uh, but I'm also quite confident that uh, our tools as, as bank regulators uh, allow us to achieve our objectives, uh, whatever it is that the FASB decides to do with the, uh, uh, with the CISO framework. All right, thank you. Uh, a couple other questions uh, related to regulations. And one on reg tech. This crisis has intensified a shift to online and digital channels across a wide swath of daily life, including financial services. Does the board have any plans to uh, increase the use of technology to digitize bank supervision? Um, 
Well, yes, that's something we've been looking at, certainly uh, before the crisis. I think most folks, uh, again, at this event know uh, uh, that, uh, you know, we've been moving to more offsite supervision, more digitization of, uh, uh, of loan files. Uh, we, we've had some examination of uh, the use of other types of technology uh, to support supervision. Uh, we will uh, definitely be continuing that. Uh, I think that, uh, again, there are, uh, you know, the COVID event uh, may have accelerated uh, somewhat uh, the degree to which we will uh, uh, sort of evaluate and apply uh, this sort of technology, but it was a very active area for us even before that. Okay, thank you. Uh, another regulatory question, this one on CRA. Uh, as we all know, the uh, OCC has issued a final rule implementing changes uh, to CRA for national banks. Uh, your fellow governor, uh, Governor Brainerd, put forth some concepts uh, earlier this year uh, with respect to CRA. Could you provide us an update with the board's thinking and timing on next steps for, for CRA? Um, well, uh, it, 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 as it, it's no secret, I mean, I've uh, certainly been very public about the fact that I think that the CRA, um, uh, that, that our implementation of the CRA, uh, both regulatorily and uh, as a matter of supervision, can be improved. Uh, it's become ossified over the years. Uh, we've done a lot of thinking about that uh, at, at the Fed and. Uh, uh, a, a lot of it um, uh, with a lot of input uh, from Gov Governor Brainerd. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, a reasonable amount of that uh, was included uh, in what the OCC has done. Uh, but there are other uh, thoughts that we've had that I think are worth, uh, will be worth exploring. The exact format uh, in which we would do that, the timing in which we would do that, you know, I, I, I don't think it's clear. I don't think it's I mean, people have a lot of uh, stuff on their plates uh, currently, so I don't think it's uh, now, uh, but, uh, uh, but that's not work that's, uh, that's going to go to waste. Okay, thank you. You've been quite outspoken uh, on the transition from LIBOR to SOFR. The board and the New York Reserve Bank have been instrumental in developing and promoting SOFR as a replacement. Would you speak to how that transition is proceeding? So it's, it's actually proceeding surprisingly, uh, uh, surprisingly well. There's an enormous amount left to do. So, uh, but I had thought that we would lose, uh, you know, three or four months uh, during this COVID event, uh, just because there are only 24 hours in a day, uh, and people had quite a lot of things to do, both in the, you know, on the regulatory side and uh, on the side of the institutions. Uh, in fact, a number of milestones uh, that uh, the, the LIBOR work streams had been working on for quite some time uh, uh, were reached during uh, this last three or four months. Uh, we didn't really lose uh, much momentum. I think we do have to step on the pedal, uh, recognizing that we have a transition that's happening in the next year and a half. Uh, but there was, uh, there was significant progress. We didn't really lose a step during the transition, which surprised me a little. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm pausing here because we just got a question uh, uh, piped in. Uh, would it be possible to ask about the board's next steps on supervisory reform you outlined in your January 20? 20 speech, including specifically the removal of foreign banks from the uh, LISIC. Uh, you know, so, you know, all, all of those, um, you know, uh, supervision is something that we will be continuing to refine. And indeed, we've learned uh, uh, quite a bit uh, during the last three and four months about, uh, you know, what works and doesn't work, what's been valuable. Uh, in our supervisory practices, uh, because the whole point is to ensure that uh, banks are prepared uh, for moments like this. Um, uh, you know, so that, you know, th that is something that will be, uh, that will be moving forward. I think a lot of these threads we are uh, picking back up. 
uh, uh, even as we speak. Um, and I think we'll be picking that them back up uh, uh, with sort of more data and experience that will be useful for the final resolution of them. Okay, thank you. Now you spoke to the stability of the banking system at the outset in the context of the FSB's report. But given the sharp downturn in economic activity domestically, are there likely to be at least some bank failures over the next few years, including a few banks larger than what generally would be considered a community bank? And assuming such failures were to occur, what concerns does the Fed have about the economic impact uh, of those failures and how they're resolved, um, both for the local and uh, regional economies? Um. Well, I, I, I would say it's quite premature uh, for us to say that it would be likely there will be more uh, bank failures, uh, e either in number or in the size of the, uh, of the institutions that fail uh, uh, going forward. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, about, the, uh, about the future evolution of the world. Uncertainty can result, by definition, can resolve itself uh, in either direction. Um, uh, and, and I would say in you know, my own base case uh, for the evolution of the event would not really say that there would be uh, a, a material increase uh, uh, in financial firm failures uh, going forward. Um, but again, uncertainty can resolve itself uh, negatively uh, and any time a community uh, loses its bank, uh, you know, that's a blow to that community. The FDIC, uh, you know, has developed its uh, resolution processes over the years to ensure uh, that, you know, to the greatest extent possible, those institutions are preserved, they're uh, taken over and their operations um, uh, maintained uh, where they are when that's possible. Uh, if not, you know, depositors are protected and, and uh, another bank will at least take over the business, uh, e even if the bank itself is not taken over. So um, I have a lot of confidence in our uh, colleagues at the FDIC uh, to handle that uh, should uh, we see some tick up uh, in that. But, uh, but again, in my view, at least, it's premature to say that we should be expecting that. Okay, thank you. One last question. Uh, and we've had several uh, other members in the last uh, couple months that sit on FSOC, uh, talk about the, the role of FSOC during this period. And I know you sit in on those meetings. I wonder if you could give us an update as to the activities of FSOC at this point in time. Well, I think the FSOC has been. Um, uh, you know, has has been doing its job uh, uh, with uh, you know, uh, continued monitoring of uh, how this event has been evolving, how the various participant uh, uh, agencies that sit on the FSOC, uh, you know, what they're doing. There's a lot of uh, information exchange uh, and coordination at the staff level, uh, as well as at the principal level. Uh, so, you know, the, the, uh, the FSOC uh, as an entity, uh, you know, in, in my view, is as much about the uh, creation of these um, uh, communication and coordination mechanisms down through the agencies uh, as it is about uh, gathering folks uh, around the table in the secretary's large conference room, although that uh, certainly has happened uh, as well during this event. And I think all that's been working as uh, very much as we would hope it to. Okay. Well, that. Uh exhaust the questions that we had prepared for this session today and we want to thank you very much for taking the time to be with the club and like you we do look forward to the time when we can all be back together at the mayflower um, as a reminder to, to the members we do not normally meet in august so our next scheduled meeting will be in in september and i encourage everyone to continue to be safe uh, during this period thank you again from the club Thank you. Thanks very much for having me.